I want to introduce now Daniel Jarvis from Kroner. Um, I asked Daniel before this, uh, you know, just backstage, what, tell me something interesting about yourself. And he's told me that uh, he, uh, he sometimes plays guitars, but more importantly, he's just bought a quad bike, um, which I think is quite fascinating, especially if you can get out onto the, into the forest and things. But probably far more important than that, he's just had his second baby. Um, last, was it last week? Last week, yeah, last seven week. days. So hot off the press and um, he's jumped back into work and jumped back into supporting us here. So thank you, Daniel, for, for coming in. So Daniel um, deals with HR and health and safety legislation at Krona, which is one of the largest HR consultancy firms in the UK. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about the Good Work Plan and a little bit around some of the HR legislation that has come in over the last couple of years. Um, I think this is really important. I know lots of people have perhaps... Um, been distracted or caught up in covid so this is a good time now to just reassess and make sure um, we've got everything in order so over to you daniel um, i'll even let you share your screen thanks karen thanks very much just share my screen now okay good afternoon everyone um obviously here to talk about um changes in hr legislation and the two most interesting things about me kieran's already sort of stolen my thunder around uh, having a child and buying a fully um, spec racing quad bike to ride through the forest so um other than that we'll crack on with all the changes in hr legislation over the past 12 months hopefully uh, you've all had a good day I, I hear it's been a been a really positive day with some really great speakers um, I know Kieran's also given me the last slot in the day, so um, I'm going to have a chat with him about that um, on the next event. And hopefully I'll get the first one, but um, uh, welcome all. Nice to meet you all. A um, um, little bit of background around myself. Um, my name is Dan. I work for a company um, called Krona. Uh, as Kieran's mentioned, it's um, the largest privately owned uh, HR health and safety company in the UK, and we've been going a long, long time. Um, I'm going to be discussing a number of things today. Um, we are going to be going through uh, changes to legislation within the sort of past 12 months. Um, and really what do I need to get in place to protect my business. Um, in order for me to do that, I wanted to um, obviously share my screen and just give a little bit of background to, to, to myself. I'm not going to bore you with the ins and outs of, of, of my, uh, my, my sort of history, but uh, this is my wife, Jade. We've been married for um, six years now. Um, this is our, our first girl uh, called Sunday that we, uh, that we had actually 21 months ago. Um, We've, uh, we live in a little place called the Forest of Dean in the southwest. Those of you that might have heard of it, normally if you uh, like going hiking, long walks, going to a local pub or uh, or camping, you would have heard of the forest. We like our dogs. We've got a couple of lovely dogs. Um, and this is a picture of our first girl that we had 21 months ago that I'm going to show all of her boyfriends um, in the future, not that she's going to have any boyfriends. So this is our little girl Sunday. The only reason I'm sh sharing that is that uh, we've also been expecting our, our second our second little baby and as Kira mentioned this is her on the right so we've called her poet um and yeah she um it was a week overdue and uh 48 hours of labor later um yeah she came and uh everyone's great mother's great baby's great i'm going to stop boring you about my personal life but i thought i'd uh, try and show something interesting about who i am uh what i do and uh, a little bit about my family so we're going to move on to to predominantly um, two massive, really important events that, that we've been hit with the, the past 12 months. One you're going to be probably significantly more familiar with than the other, uh, that being COVID, obviously, um, and the huge impact that that has had on business. Some some of us positive, some of us a very negative impact, but also the huge impact it's had on us from an employer's perspective of legally what we have to have in place around risk assessments, being COVID secure, um, updating our health and safety policy procedures, so on and so forth. It's been a really interesting year this past uh, 12 months and predominantly my roles changed massively. So normally I'm out um, on a day to day basis doing about 4000 miles um, a month, going out, seeing businesses and normally dealing with with live issues at the moment. My roles changed now, whereby I'm predominantly working um, 12 hours a day, doing six, seven, eight video calls day in, day out. The help that we've been able to give organizations over the past 12 months around around the the, the impact that COVID had on business has been has been it's been fantastic there's also another event that happened around 12 months ago that maybe you're not so familiar with and it's called the good work plan so we've had two huge changes one being COVID and the huge impact that that has had on us from a health and safety perspective the other one is the good work plan. I'm going to go into detail of what the good work plan is, what it is, why is it so important. But in order for me to do that, I'm just trying to, going to try and give a bit of context and background beforehand. So 
in order for me to try and um, put the good work plan um, in, 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 into, into more context, basically, I need to give you an idea of what we do at Krona and what I guess a normal day looks like for me. So those of you that may have heard of Krona or not, um, I'm not gonna bore you with the ins and outs of us as a, as, a, as a business, but we've been going around 80 years, we're privately owned, we employ around 500 people, and we specialize in HR, employment law, and health and safety. So we support small to medium-sized businesses, normally with, with issues and problems. A normal day is quite interesting for me. I often um, uh, tell a lot of uh, a lot of the employees I speak with, my, my role's a little bit like EastEnders. So I wake up in the morning, I do all my prep. <clears throat> I normally start work uh, with video calls around eight and normally finish around six, seven, eight o'clock at night. And those um, video calls that I have are normally with employers of small businesses, normally employing between one employee up to sort of 50, 60 employees. Now, the reason I'm saying this is Unfortunately, the majority of these conversations that I have with employers um, are when there's a problem. So genuinely, I'll log on to a video call. I'll meet an employer of a small uh, of a small business. And in the nicest way, I have to listen to 30, 45 minutes to that employer venting around the issue that they have within their business. And that issue can um, can differ in complexity. Often it's either a complex issue around a disciplinary a suspension and investigation or unfortunately it's an issue that maybe wasn't handled well three or four weeks ago and now it's got a little bit more serious so now that employee's gone away been dismissed or resigned gone to ACAS and now things are going down the tribunal routes the reason I'm saying that um, is that um, is that really that depending on the complexity of that problem whether it's a severe disciplinary or, or a complex tribunal, um, um, we can we we will often then be be dragged into a difficult conversation of, of why didn't you contact us three months ago, four months ago, three weeks ago when this problem started? So the few things I just wanted to touch on on what we often talk about on those calls, those issues can be as simple as someone being late, an employee being late three or four times a week or three or four times a month. And how as an employer do I deal with that? It can be as simple as an employee having a bad attitude. Maybe their work's okay, but this attitude is having a negative effect on the rest of the team. The past 12 months, I've been pulled into a huge amount of conversations around well-being. So those are the individuals that have been um, forced to be, let's say, furloughed um, or working from home. It's had a huge neg negative impact on their productivity, their mental health. Um, and now employers are struggling to know how to deal with that. Or it could be, for instance, performance related. Maybe you have a salesperson that uh, has to hit strict, strict targets and they're not doing that for whatever reason. The reason why I'm mentioning these, these uh, sort of examples is that as I'm pulled into these conversations, irrespective of the problem that that employer is experiencing, I try not to overcomplicate it and bring it back to um, a couple of simple things. And that main thing is bringing it back to documentation. And this will link into the good work plan shortly. So if someone's saying I've got a problem with someone that's consistently late and I don't know how to deal with it, very easily I'll ask the question, well, just talk me through what it says in your documentation around lateness. What does it say within your contracts of employment? What does it say within your employee handbook or your policies and procedures? Um, if someone's now got an issue with, with, with mental health or well-being. Straight away, I'll ask that employer, okay, well, what, what does your well-being policy say? Do you even have one in place? Have you updated this recently over the last 12 months with everyone working from home and suffering? If it's a performance issue, what does it say within, I don't know, probationary periods or short service dismissal clauses or other policies and procedures on how you're going to deal with that? And again, unfortunately, often the responses are, well, we don't have anything written down around lateness. Or we don't have anything written down around well-being. We don't have much really in the way of, of performance management. And I can't emphasize enough that of the 80 to 85% of video calls that we sit day in and day out, when there's an issue, a problem or a tribunal, majority of these issues, problems and tribunals could well have been avoided if we just had the right documentation processes and policies in place. So, Irrespective of the complexity of the problem, and normally they are quite complex and quite serious, everything often comes down to documentation, especially if that issue has now um, turned into more of a serious dispute. 
an issue all gone down the tribunal route, everything will come down to, to contract law. So what is in your contracts of employment that you issue to your staff? If you're experiencing a problem with an individual, what process did you follow? What evidence do you have of this process? And what does it say within your documentation? So your contracts, your policies and your procedures. So these are the questions I often ask nearly every employer on every single call. And um, I'm going to ask these questions now. I know I can't see or, or hear anyone, uh, but if you've got any questions at, at any point, feel free to drop them in the, the Q&A box. I'll keep an eye on it. Kieran will keep an eye on it. Um, it will be interesting to get a little bit of feedback around these type of, of questions. So if you were all to ask yourself the following questions, you know, when was the last time your contracts were updated and reissued to your staff? First and foremost, do we have contracts of employment in place? Does everyone have a signed uh, uh, contract? And when was it last updated and reissued? The reason why that's key, and I'll come onto it with a good work plan, if we do have employees that have worked with us a number of years, they might be your best friend, your brother, your sister, whatever it may be. If there is a contract in place, but maybe it's three, four, five, six years old, and then you are hit with a dispute or a problem, this can really cause you a headache and serious issues. So really important to consider how up to date our contracts are, not just for new staff we might be recruiting, but how, how recently we have updated and reissued to current staff. If you all ask yourself the question, um, and I see this all the time, you know, are your contracts, your documentation, are they predominantly templated and generic agreements? Um, the majority of, of, of contracts that I critique and review, the simple answer is yes, they are. Um, this is a question I always ask, and it's really important. We're going to come, up, come, come on to this, and it will tie in with a good work plan as well, um, is do we have a ro robust employee handbook in place? So if we do have a statement of main terms or a contract of employment that we've issued to all our staff, that's fantastic. That's really positive. But what do we have accompanying that contract in relation to policies, procedures? And is it wrapped up into a really nice watertight, watered down, easily digestible format of a handbook? It's a question that I often ask and a lot of employers um, are normally hit with a bit of a blank, um, a blank stare when I ask this question. But if you do have contracts in place and you feel they are relatively up to date, um, are your contracts employer or, or, or employee centric? This is really important. And please don't get me wrong when I say this, we're not trying to take away employee rights or anything like that. But um, really key that the clauses you have within your contracts and the policies and procedures that you have within your handbooks um, are heavily weighted in favour of your business and senior management. And the reason I say that is the, the majority of, of, of um, contracts that I critique and review, in essence, what the employer is doing is heavily weighting things in favour of their employees. And again, don't get me wrong, the majority of human beings and staff and employees are great people. And you're not going to have a problem with them. But the moment there is an issue, a dispute, a problem, you need to terminate someone's, uh, someone's employment, you really need your documentation to be working for you as the employer in the business. So that'll be something to, to look at moving forward. Do we have compliant contracts in place? When were they last looked at and updated? And am I weighting things in favor of me as the employer to protect my business? Or actually, am I weighting everything in favor of my staff? And then if you do have contracts in place and policies and procedures and handbooks, that's great. But also you may just wanna ask yourself the question, um, how good are you at, at following your own? internal policies and procedures. And I can't tell you the amount of business owners that I speak with that do have a handbook in place, do have an upstate contract of employment, but then when there's a problem or a dispute, actually they don't follow their own internal uh, uh, policies or procedures. And then when there's an issue and this gets complicated, that very much works against them. Um, these are the answers that, that we often receive. So when was the last time your contracts were updated and reissued? And out of the six to eight video calls I have every day, Genuinely, th th these are normally the responses. Um, I've never, ever updated my contracts in the last 15 years. Um, we've never had any issues or concerns, so we don't feel it's important. Um, and what I often say genuinely to everyone that I speak to, contracts, policies and procedures are semi irrelevant if you never have a problem. If you never have an issue with, with any member of staff, who cares about the contract? But the moment you have a problem with just one member of staff, that's when your contracts, your policies become vitally important. Um, so I would say 
If you haven't updated your contracts and looked at your contracts recently, you may want to consider that. Um, are they predominantly templated or generic agreements? I get this answer all the time. Yes, uh, we don't bespoke our documentation as we're able to resolve most disputes with a conversation and most, most of our staff are reasonable. And again, what do I say to most employees? Well, of course, most people are reasonable. Most of us are nice people and we're grateful to have a job and we'll do everything we can for our manager, our boss, our company. But again, unfortunately, there are a small percentage of people that are unreasonable. So really important just to consider how bespoke your documentation is and how well it is tailored to your business. How do you want to manage absence? How do you want to manage sickness? If you've got employees over the past 12 months that have suffered with depression, stress, anxiety, mental health, how, as, you, as an employee, your duty of care to your employee, how do you want to help them? And how have we then created that audit trail of how we're helping them within our, our documentation? Do you have a robust employee handbook in place? Um, I often get this answer. So we, uh, we don't have one. It hasn't been looked at in years uh, or, you know, or it hasn't been looked at in years. We don't need one as we trust our staff and treat them like adults. Now I'm smiling as I say this, um, don't get me wrong. Of course you want to trust your staff and you want to treat them like adults. And I'm not suggesting in any way, shape or form that you don't do that. But again, we trust our staff and we treat them like adults. The moment we have an issue, if there's no clear expectations or processes written down within an employee handbook, then it's very difficult for us to fight our corner as the employer especially when everything's so heavily weighted in favour of the employee already. Um, are your contracts employer or employee centric? Like, a, uh, like I touched on earlier, <coughs> excuse me. Normally um, out of the three or four contracts I critique every single day, they're heavily employee centric. So again, please don't get me wrong. It is your business. It is your employees and you will manage and run your business how you want to do that. But I say to everyone from a documentational point of view, you very much want to plan for worst case with your documentation. You'll still continue with your company ethos and your management, and your positivity and your culture and all those great things. And you'll trust your staff and you'll treat them well. But the moment we have that one issue, it could be a reduction in work. It could be that we've had to furlough people. It could be a pandemic whereby there's no work anymore. And we have to look at reducing hours or go down a redundancy process that's when unfortunately people's attitudes change and that's when we want documentation working for us as a business owner um, and how good are you at following your own procedures unfortunately a lot of the times where i'm involved with disciplinary suspensions investigations tribunals with business owners that do have robust agreements and handbooks in place unfortunately i often get the answer well we didn't actually follow our internal process to the letter because we wanted to give the you know the member of staff the benefit of the doubt we've worked with them for five or ten years we're good friends and again i'm not trying to say you should categorically change the way in which you manage your employees but if we now uh, are able to get robust compliant watertight policies in place really important that we follow them especially if we can fast forward six months and we're at a tribunal this will be what will be put under under the spotlight what did it say in your documentation? How did you follow it? And what evidence do you have of following that? And nine times out of 10, unfortunately, the process followed that was, uh, was incorrect. The internal procedure that was documented within the handbook wasn't followed. And, uh, and it can make it very difficult for, uh, for, for you as an employer to win that tribunal. So just a few things you may want to ask there. Just gonna have a sip of water. <clears throat> Forgive me. Um, I'm a dad for the second time, not being up for the past seven days. So uh, forgive the bags under the eyes or my croaky, uh, my croaky voice. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we, we talked about predominantly what, what we do at Krona. We help businesses with HR and health and safety. And normally, unfortunately, people get in touch with us when there's a problem. At that point, we can very much help, but it is significantly more complex and more expensive. Um, at that point, when there is a problem or an issue, everything comes back to documentation. What does it say in your contracts? How compliant are they? How employer centric are they? What does it say in your, in your policies and procedure? And how well did you follow that process? And normally there's no contracts in place or they're poor, out of date, compliant, and no process has been followed. So why is it so important to have updated contracts and policies in place? Now, this is where it's going to link into what's called this good work plan that came into effect on April the 6th last year. First and foremost, um, it's a legal requirement. 
So this isn't me, Dan Jervis or Krona saying this is something that you may want to consider. From an employment law perspective, it's a legal requirement to have a contract of employment in place. And when I go into detail on what the good work plan is, it's now a legal requirement to have a good work plan compliant contract of employment in place for all new staff coming on board. Um, so that's one good reason to, to review uh, your documentation, because legally, you know, we employ people, there's rules and regulations we have to follow. Let's make sure we're above board and protected if there's a problem. Two, um, it can genuinely often prevent those disputes and those problems. If we employ someone to do A, B and C and we have clear expectations on a body of a contract, what we expect and clear expectations on policies and procedures, if someone's going to be late or if someone's going to be sick or if someone's going to have an issue with X, Y and Z, it can often prevent us getting to that point a year down the line where there's an impasse or a, or a serious dispute. So real, it's a real positive to get on top of this now before there's a problem. Um, and three, genuinely Really robust contracts and documentation can protect your business if and when you are faced with a complex problem or a tribunal, as we mentioned earlier. At that point, if you're hit with a tribunal at any point, everything comes down to contract law. So really vital we get your contracts right. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to give you two examples. So in relation to why it's so important we have up to date compliant contracts, documentation, handbooks, policies, procedures in place is over the past year, and I'm not going to name obviously the businesses, <clears throat> but I had two conversations recently with, with two businesses relatively local to me. One was a restaurant owner, um, owned a chain of restaurants, really nice restaurants. Um, and they called us <clears throat> because they had an issue with an employee that hadn't been there long. They had issued them a contract of employment, but it was relatively templated and generic. I think they'd found it free somewhere on Google. And anyway, long and short of it is they had a real problem with this employee. I actually went down, uh, and I won't say where, but I, I went down to meet the owner at their main restaurant. It was a little bit like um, Goodfellas. And uh, the, the reason I say that is I was led down into the basement of the restaurant and they're an Italian family. And there's around six or seven Italian um, uh, directors there. Speaking Italian, I didn't know what they were saying. I was incredibly intimidated um, and they were, obviously very frustrated as to what was happening. Basically, they'd been taken to a tribunal um, for, it was unfair dismissal and, and breach of contract. And to give you a bit of the backstory, they employed someone that they'd found out had been stealing from the business. So it was a waiter that was overcharging a table. Um, each table he'd overcharge, be able to fiddle the, the EPOS system, and then be able to take cash and pocket cash um, and they managed to get evidence through CCTV and through their system that over, I believe it was a 12 month period, stole over 20,000 pounds. So it was a lot of money. When the owner of the restaurant found this out, they were obviously incredibly emotional, frustrated, upset, um, and they instantly sacked him on the spot. Um, they didn't just instantly sack him, so they didn't follow any process. They didn't really investigate that much. They, they investigated a little, found out what the problem was, and then remove them from the business. Um, they also went on to then try and claw back as much money as they could from the individual. I won't go into too much detail, but this is how unfortunate we are when it comes to employment law, that an individual that's worked for a, a locally owned, great, great, great restaurant business is categorically stealing from the business because the process in which they followed by terminating his contract and trying to claw back some money and not pay him, you know, what they owed him in wages, he was actually able to take him to a tribunal. And this went through to a tribunal whereby he actually won. And it came down to a few very simple things. The contracts that they had issued were heavily out of date, incredibly generic and templated. They didn't follow a correct process when it came to terminating his employment. And they also didn't contractually have the right to deduct anything from his uh, from his wages because there was no deduction of wages clause within the contract. And you can understand that I was in the, the this basement of an Italian restaurant with six or seven Italian uh, family members where I had to tell them that, that categorically they were more than likely going to lose this tribunal, even though this employee had been stealing large sums of money over the last 12 months. Um, hopefully it gives you an idea 
of how frustrating things can be when maybe we're looking to grow a business, recruit people, um, and how difficult the tribunal process can be, whereby everything is categorically weighted towards that employee. And moving forward, hindsight's a great thing, but if this business owner had robust contracts of employment in place, robust policies and procedures, when they found out what the issue was, spoke to a professional, followed a clear process, they would have avoided a very expensive tribunal and not to mention all the time, frustration, emotion, legal representation, all of those things. So even when an employee does something categorically wrong, unfortunately, they're still able to take advantage of the system. The other example I just wanted to share with you was a recruitment company that I went to see in London, who um, it's still ongoing, but got taken to a tribunal um, for a racial discrimination for someone that hadn't even worked for them yet. So actually employees have rights, not just from day one of employment, very much potentially they have rights before they've even started work for you, i.e. through an interview process. Now I'm not gonna go into the, the huge details of this case, but I went to see this recruitment company. The owner was, was very frustrated. Um, they'd basically interviewed someone for a, for a new position. Um, I learned all about something called fashion houses. They recruit people basically into fashion houses, making clothes for like Zara and H&M. A friend of the owner recommended an individual uh, to come and work for the business. They had an interview. Long story short, at the end of the interview, uh, they said, we don't feel you've got the, the right qualifications and I'm not going to recommend you into my clients. Um, and a week later, that individual uh, went to a no window fee solicitor and put in a claim for racial discrimination, saying you didn't offer me the job um, because I'm from Iran. That case has been ongoing now for a couple of years, whereby the employer still hasn't won the case, hasn't lost it yet, but has spent over £20,000 in legal representation for someone that never even worked for them. Now, I won't go to, into the details now on what, what could have been avoided, but with them, again, it was audit, trail, process and documentation really from the recruitment perspective, that 99% of the time follow a process of, if you want an interview, you've got to fill out your details on our website. We're going to um, um, uh, then contact you, go through a series of questions, have a formalized interview, and then we're going to email uh, the, uh, the sort of the outcome of that um, um, off the back of that interview. With this situation, um, it didn't happen. Sorry, I've just dropped my mouse. I've been up, I've been up for, uh, for seven days, <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> Right, I'm back, hopefully you can hear me. So I'll just go back to this slide. Um, so again, following a, a clear process and having that clearly um, identified throughout your documentation, throughout your policies and procedures could have very much prevented what happened with this individual. So it's just a, that's just literally a couple of examples. I could I could talk through example after example after example. Unfortunately, the majority of calls we sit day in and day out are very similar conversations. Someone, unfortunately, everyone's a lawyer these days. Google's great when it comes to transparency. We all can find out what our rights are. If we do employ people, if we're looking to employ people, I can't emphasize enough finding a professional to get your documentation in order before maybe we go through that growth. Um, and planning for worst case. And don't get me wrong, let's be positive. You know, we're all coming out of COVID, the sun's shining here, hopefully businesses are growing, we're all getting back to work, but let's make sure, you know, our documentation is protecting us as, a, us as a employers. Okay, so why is it so important to have your, your, your documents updated now? So again, I can't emphasize enough, updating um, your documentation before you have the problem. It will save you a headache, um, a huge amount of money and complexity. So if you're able to speak to a professional and get them updated before we've got that issue, can't emphasize enough, please do it. Um, you might be growing or recruiting. So the amount of businesses I've spoken to after the part, uh, um, um, around the, the last 12 months where COVID's had a negative effect, some it's had a hugely positive effect whereby they've, they've, never, they've never sort of turned over enough, uh, um, it's as much sort of uh, uh, revenue. If now, as we're coming out of COVID, if you are planning to, to grow, to recruit, to bring on more staff, it's a really important time to get your contracts ready for day one. And I'll come on to that because of part of this good work plan, these changes that have come into effect last year, anyone that we're now recruiting, 
legally we have to issue a good work plan compliant contract of employment from day one. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. We might be reopening and staff returning to an office. It's exciting. I've been, I, I say I meet, you know, six to eight employees every day. I haven't met anyone in a year, really. I've just sat in my back bedroom and uh, and talked virtually, you know, for 12 hours a day. So I'm excited in getting back to an office, going back to see clients and businesses. If you are reopening and staff are returning to an office, really important time to review your policies and procedures. What have we got in place around COVID, around being COVID secure? How have we updated our documents from a home worker's perspective or a home working perspective? Are we going to offer more flexible working? Are people more productive at working at home? Actually, they're going to stay working at home. Are staff coming back from furlough? I can't tell you enough the amount of conversations that I've had over the past 12 months around, and I have to tread carefully as I say this, but certain individuals becoming really comfortable with furlough. You know, probably enjoying the fact that they might be getting paid 80 percent or 100 percent of the wage and watch Good Morning Britain every day and take the dog out for a nice uh, a nice walk every afternoon. So if we are reopening, bringing staff potentially back for back from furlough, what objections are we potentially going to receive from that? And if we are able to get staff back off of furlough, how are we updating them? with a new contract of employment and new policies and procedures that have to be different because COVID's changed everything. Um, will staff remain working from home or, or work more flexibly? A number of employees I've spoken to over the last 12 months actually say we don't need the office anymore. My staff are happier, more productive. We've, uh, we, we, we've never brought on as many clients as, as we have. So if that is the case, how have we updated our contracts of employment or our, or our, or our um, policies and procedures to reflect home working? If we haven't around really robust, for instance, mobility clauses, we really need to look at that. Might want to consider if individuals' job roles has changed. Um, hi, Karen, you right? Yeah, so I just got, we had a question in the chat there, or, or more a comment, I think it was um, from Matt Cole. Um, just, he just, I thought it was worth, it's worth saying, he said, what you say makes so much sense. Until recently, I worked for a large corporate and spent lots of 2019 trying to avoid employee tribunals where processes hadn't been followed. This ended up with me offering people lots of money to avoid going to an employment tri tribunal. Was the company at fault? Yes, because the official process hadn't been followed and so the company couldn't demonstrate why decisions were made. Every time people used equality legislation to demonstrate that a company hadn't followed process. So clearly people are seeing examples of what you're saying. Um, I just thought it was, you might want some interaction. <laughs> no, thank you. And I appreciate I appreciate the comments, Matt and Kieran. Hopefully it distracted from me dropping my mouse and then clambering <laughs> to try and find it. So um no, re really really appreciate that. And um and it's it's I mean Kieran, we've known each other for, for a while now and had a number of conversations around around this where, whereby it's um genuinely this is what I see day in and day out. Um unfortunately the majority of my conversations are where things are at a point where there's a problem. And I say to everyone, unfortunately the two main things that every employer normally puts to the bottom of the list, and don't get me wrong, we understand why, it's HR and health and safety. Um, and then when there's a dispute or an accident or a problem, that's when they really need support. So yeah, yeah Matt, um, you know, if you've got any any other questions around any, anything, you know, that, that that's concerning you more than happy to, you know, to have a conversation at some point. Um, but yeah, when me and you, Kieran, had a chat, you've got the, the best company in the world and all your staff are the happiest staff in the world, aren't they? They're all great. You've got you've got a great team. So, um, so yeah, were there any other questions, Kieran, at all? I, I did, I did miss that. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and let you know when the more come up, okay? Brilliant. Fantastic. Um, okay, so, yeah, just uh, around remaining working from home um, or, or being, uh, yeah, being more flexible. Uh, um, yeah, sorry, individuals' job roles changed. Um, this has happened a lot over the past 12 months. So if roles have changed and someone's taken on extra work or COVID's have had an effect on that. We need to update this within our job roles, job specs and within the body of the contract now as well. And I'll come on to why we need to do that. Um, look, I, I'm all about being positive. Genuinely, the sunshine and I've been out. Uh, we've been out to eating with a newborn um, um, out in the cold um, outside our local pub, I think, a couple of times this week. And look, you know, we're going to be able to eat inside a pub soon as well. So look, genuinely, the message here is positivity. It's great. But hopefully businesses are growing. We're getting back to some form of normality. But we do want to consider updating contracts and documentation from a COVID perspective. And the only reason I say that if and I hope I never need to use the word again, but if there is another uh, potential wave or an issue or a pandemic or anything like that, and there is a reduction of work and the furlough scheme isn't now available, if it does come to that, how are our contracts and documentation working for us as the employer to potentially have a little bit more control over staff's hours? 
maybe in reducing staff's hours or temporarily laying staff off if we needed to. Now that's a last case scenario, but again, I can't tell you the amount of times where employers over this past 12 months have, have, have had to go down a redundancy route because they didn't have robust clauses within their contract to automatically and contractually be able to reduce staff's hours. And it actually ended in a number of individuals losing their jobs. Um, and how has lockdown affected your staff? It, well-being and support. So why is it important to update documentation now? I'm sure, um, I'm sure a number of you that, that, that employ individuals, unfortunately, have probably had conversations around, you know, some staff saying, I don't enjoy working from home. Uh, you know, I couldn't think of anything worse if I was still living at home with my mum and dad, and then I had to work from a dining room table or from my bed for 12 hours a day. So if there have been conversations or concerns around well-being, mental health, okay, well, how are we addressing that as an employer? And how are we updating our well-being policy? What support are we now going to give our staff that are either remaining working from home or coming back to an office? So it's a really important time to start reviewing all your documentation and getting it in place for you then to focus on all the exciting stuff, growing your business, recruiting, all that, all that good stuff. OK. Um, so I'm going to come on to what the good work plan is, but I just wanted to give it a bit of background as to why documentation policies and procedures are so important. This is another reason why it's so key to update documentation now. So the Good Work Plan came into effect on April the 6th last year. Um, if we haven't heard of it, and I'm saying this with a smile on my face, but if we haven't heard of it, it is the biggest overhaul of employment law legislation in 30 years, in a generation. Now, don't get me wrong, it came into play at the beginning of a pandemic. We actually initially thought the government were going to push back on this, because guess what? We were all trying to deal with COVID and save our businesses. Um, but for whatever reason, they didn't. They pushed with it the biggest update in employment law legislation in 30 years. And because it was amongst the pandemic, what happened? No one really heard of it. Now, obviously, we were preparing our clients six months, 12 months before for, the, for these changes. But if we haven't heard of it, really important that at some point either we have a conversation or you speak to a, a professional in, in the industry to talk you through what those changes are. It's had a huge impact um, on what needs to be on a contract of employment amongst a number of, of things around working status, things like what's going on with Uber at the moment. Um, now, it is a legal requirement for new staff to have a good work plan compliant agreement from day one. Just to give you an idea, pre-April the 6th last year, anyone that you employed, you actually had a two month time frame to issue a contract of employment to your staff. We always advise ignoring that because we all know a lot can happen within two months. We'd still advise issuing that on day one. But it's now a legal requirement. If you are looking to grow the business, if you are recruiting at the moment from day one, we need a good work plan compliant agreement issued and in place. You should also consider, though, when you're updating your contracts of employment to to include everything from the good work plan i would consider reissuing it to all your current staff and employees and the reason i say that is and don't get me wrong i had an ops director a few weeks ago laugh at me when i said this um because he said if you look at my contract of employment it still says apprentice engineer from 1986 or something and it's not been changed since so if you do have a number of employees that have been on the books for 5 10 15 20 years and they haven't received an updated contract of employment for a few years, really important we consider reissuing that to them. And the reason for that is, I mean, I can tell you of the pregnancy discrimination cases that I'm involved with in, in, at the moment, that, um, for instance, there's been a lot of changes around family friendly legislation that needs to be on a contract of employment now. If it's not on there and someone's claiming pregnancy discrimination, and we don't have that information around family friendly legislation, well, again, it's going to heavily weight towards your employee as opposed to the employer. The other things around retirement, for instance, if you still got things on contract saying you must retire at whatever age it may be, well, there's no retirement age anymore. Your contracts need to be updated and reissued to all current staff. And then obviously they need to be in the right format moving forward for any new staff. OK. Um, so we've got a little bit, a little bit of time left. So what specifically needs changing? <clears throat> I'm not going to go through the whole uh, good work plans. It was a 64 page document presented to the government. There's a lot of information in there. But what actually needs to be changed? Top line, there's a few very important things on here. And you may um, this evening, tomorrow, if, you, if you, you go through your contracts, feel free to use this as a, a bit of a checklist and see where you're at from a compliance perspective. But 
if we're growing or recruiting, for instance, I've already mentioned as a day one requirement, so we now need to, to have that, that, that new contract for employment from day one. But what's actually changed? So job titles and descriptions. If we don't have job type, if we don't have specific job descriptions written for each role, something you, you're going to need to get, uh, you need to get nailed down as soon as possible. The reason I say that is if you do have job description written down now, a lot of the time we see on contracts that you refer to Appendix 1, you know, for your detailed job description. Now, you can still do that, but as part of the good work plan from April the 6th last year, the government has said, however, on top of that, on the body of the contract, we need to have an overview of key tasks and key duties for each job title. Now, that's super important. And the reason I say that is to not overcomplicate things. If I'm employing you to be a receptionist, to answer calls and to book appointments in diaries or to deal with clients or whatever it may be, if we don't have contractual evidence of clear expectations of why we're employing you, and then we have a problem, a dispute, a tribunal, again, everything is gonna be heavily weighted to that to that former member of staff. So this isn't, again, Crona saying this, government has said from April the 6th last year, and any, um, um, any job title on, on a body of a contract, we need to have key tasks and key, du key duties included in that. Also, just to tie in with the point of updating and reissuing this to any current staff in place, if you've got staff that have been employed for three, five, ten years and their job roles changed, they're now doing significantly you know, different things or they've been promoted, that's why we also need to update that on the contract and reissue that to them. And again, I can't tell you enough, if you have a dispute and it's not reflected on the contract of what you're employing someone to do, again, you're, you're leaving yourself very vulnerable. Probationary period, just to give you an example, again, I know everything or predominantly a lot of things we talk about is negative. I am smiling. I am trying to be positive. Things are great. We are getting out of COVID. Um, but unfortunately, again, we're normally we're normally dealing with the problems, the issues in the tribunals. So my brain is very much wired to think worst case. So probationary periods, if we're growing, that's exciting. That's great. But first and foremost, have a probationary period in place. There's been key changes to what you need to include in the probationary period now. So first and foremost, would advise that, you know, you reserve the right to extend your probationary period if there are issues. But there's real specifics we have to have in the contract now if we're extending. We have to detail the maximum length of that extension and it has to be reasonable. I see probationary periods of six months or 12 months long sometimes with an extension of another 12 months. And this just isn't reasonable or enforceable. So there are key changes to what needs to be in a probationary period. we we'll are going to detail now. There's also um, key suggestions that we would make within a probationary period ar around waiving, for instance, your full disciplinary process. So if, I don't know, you have gone on a recruitment drive, brought five new salespeople in, three of them, unfortunately, very quickly, you just know they're not right for the business and you want to move them on. You don't want to be tying yourself to overly long performance improvement plans or disciplinary process. Sometimes you need to have a quick conversation and terminate their employment. You can do that, but it's dependent on how well your contracts and probationary periods are written. I touched on this earlier, layoff and short time working clauses reduction in work. So one of the biggest clauses that have caused uh, businesses a problem over the past 12 months. I've been hit with COVID, my business is struggling, I need to either reduce staff's hours, otherwise I'm not going to have a business here. Now if contractually you had a really robust layoff and short time working clause in the contract, then you'd be able to do that. But the majority of companies I deal with don't have it. And then what happens, they have a conversation with the employee, we need you all to reduce your hours to save the business, 80% say yes, 20% say no, and then they have to go through a redundancy process. So really key to look at that. If you don't have a layoff and short time working clause in your contract, let's have a chat. Um, this is going to be a biggie, flexible working from home. Is this now reflected in your documentation? So if staff were working in an office five days a week and now you say, well, look, you can work at home two days a week, one day a week, well, how have you updated that from a documentation point of view? If now you're saying we don't need the office and you're going to work from home, great. How have you updated that? How are we incorporating that into our recruitment processes and our questioning? You know, is your home environment suitable to work from home? Or are you going to be working from a dining room table with mom and dad in the background chatting and cooking? Um, so something really key to consider also, we don't have time now to go into the detail, but um, there is a huge knock on effect from a health and safety perspective here. If we have staff continuing to work from home, what home worker risk assessments have we done and what display screen um, equipment um, uh, risk assessments have we put in place? Your uh, duty of care is exactly the same for someone working from home as it, as it may be in your office. Family friendly legislation, other paid leave entitlements. We'll go into the detail now, but there is a lot of changes as to what has to be on your contracts now around what's called other paid leave entitlements, maternity, paternity, um, um, adoption, uh, bereavement, um, share parental leave, parental leave. There's huge changes around that. Often that would sit in a separate handbook. We have to now get it on the body of a contract. Big changes around training. 
if you as a business or an organization do any type of training for any staff, i.e. qualifications, certifications, accreditations that cost you money. And I don't know, the best example I can give is I own a plumbing company and I've got 20 plumbers and I put them all through a two and a half grand course to get qualified. And if after that course, five of them took the, took the qualification and left and went somewhere else for a pay rise, I'll probably be annoyed about that. And I'm going to want some of that money back. You need two things. You need a training entitlement clause in the body of the contract and we need a separate training agreement in place now. So again, anyone that does any type of training at a cost to you as the employer, we need to talk you through what training agreements you need to have in place and what needs to be on the contract. This now needs to be heavily linked with a deductions clause. Um, um, I've been involved with tribunals of care homes that have gen gen genuinely terminated someone's employment. That individual hadn't returned a 60 pound fleece. They because of the principle of it, deducted £60 from their final pay and it ended in a tribunal because they didn't have the contractual right to deduct that because it wasn't mentioned on the contract. So the government from April the 6th have made a lot of changes around deduction of wages. So I guess I guess the best example I can give is I'm normally driving a lot, I have a company car, an iPad, a, a laptop, a phone, a number of other company property. If I were to leave or be dismissed, and hopefully that never happens, um, and there are specific specifically more things in my contract of employment around what Corona can deduct from my salary as opposed to the receptionist that just turns up to, to head office uh, every day and doesn't have that equipment. A lot of changes around company benefits. If you do offer any company benefits, they have to be on a body of a contract now. Uh, and also, I can't emphasize enough, consider some type of EAP or wellbeing policy. EAP being an employee assistance program. Um, that would be some, something along the lines of 24-7 counselling for your staff, some type of occupational health, whatever it may be. And I'd advise that for a couple of reasons. If you're ever hit with a problem or a tribunal, genuinely, it's a very easy way to get in the judge's good books. If someone's saying you only sack me because I suffer from depression and I'm taking you to court for disability discrimination, but we can, can prove from a contractual point of view that actually as an employer, we give you 24 seven counseling, we offer X, Y, and Z, we've got an open door policy. It's a really good way to protect the business. Obviously for the important fact of, um, it's a great thing to offer as well. If you've genuinely got employees suffering from mental health, well, it's a great thing to be able to offer them. So again, speak to speak to some professionals around EAPs. They're not as much money as you may think for smaller businesses. Uh, again, we can help you with that if you wanted to have a chat. And then just touching on it briefly, um, um, around the documentation of vaccinations and testing policies, the amount of conversations I'm having with businesses where um, um, I'm going to a face-to-face -face meeting tomorrow and the employer requested that I was tested and, and that's fine. I'm going to do that. I'll be able to show evidence of that. But there is kickback from, from some employees saying, I, don't, I refuse to be tested. I refuse to be vaccinated. So what's our policy on that? What's our vaccination policy? How are we going to encourage our staff to do that if we do want them to? <clears throat> so that's really top line. Um, there is a huge amount of changes with a good work plan. But I guess what I'm saying is, is... If your contracts and documentation haven't been reviewed in the last 12 months, um, really important that you, that you do this because of the changes the Good Work Plan has brought, because of the impact that COVID has had on our business. And then from a positive perspective, we're now able to get back to work and grow our business. Let's get the foundation of your documentation in place now. Plan for worst case. Hopefully you never have it. You never have any problems and we never need to hear from you. But the moment you do then have a problem, your documentation is working for you. Um, and then finally, um, just to finish off uh, before we've got about 10 minutes for questions, um, what do we have accompanying our contracts? I can't emphasize enough. It's a bit of a strange one, an employee handbook. Legally, you do not need an employee handbook in place. But if you've now got a dispute with someone because they've been sick for three months and it's having a big impact on your business, and then you've got no clear expectations around your sickness policy or absence policy or whatever it may be, how on earth can you then fight your argue, argument at an employment tribunal? So you don't legally need it. Best practice, I've heavily advised that you have it. Have some type of watered down, easily digestible um, handbook that just sets out your clear expectations. Um, or do you have a raft of policies and procedures? You can have a raft of policies or procedures, but also the amount of times I see companies that have a, a, a G drive that has 2000 policies and procedures on, the reality is no employee is ever gonna have time or, 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 or the desire to read them. Get it into a nice handbook that's easy, easy to process. Have these been updated to be COVID secure? 
are these policies that you have within the contract of employment or are they in a separate handbook? I don't have time to go into the detail now, but you do not want overly long, complicated contracts of employment that talk about your IT policy or your smoking policy, because now what you're doing is, is you're making a number of these things contractual. And the moment you want to change anything, you don't have the flexibility to because you then you have to consult and, and in essence ask permission to change these things. So we need to have a number of policies and procedures in place, but we need to make sure they're in the right place and they're non-contractual sat somewhere else to give you flexibility that as your business changes and grows, you're able just to change that update version two of the handbook and reissue. And finally, how well do we follow our own procedures? Once we've bespoke your contracts, handbooks, policies, procedures, got them all in place, how well are we actually following them? Um, most of the time, unfortunately, they're not followed. So we've got a bit of time for, for questions. I just always leave with this last slide just to let you know if anyone on the call um, does have any uh, you know, sensitive or confidential cases, any problems at the moment, complex issues, genuinely our relationship you know, with, with, with Kieran and Stripe, just feel free to drop me an email, drop me a call. Um, there's a few things that, that we'll do. I will do everything I can first and foremost to help you and to offer you the, the best advice that we can. Because we've talked around the good work plan documentation and contracts, no obligation, get in touch. We're going to do full documentation reviews for you as well. So I'll personally review your contracts, your policies and procedures. And in the nicest way, on a call, I'll share my screen and I'll share back from two points of view. Are these compliant or not? And are there five red flags or 55 red flags? Um, and also how employer centric or employee centric or employee centric is your documentation? And then I'll talk you through basically our suggestions. We would change X, Y and Z to basically protect the business. That's no obligation. If you'd like us to do that or discuss any other matters, more than happily do that. Um, appreciate your time. Hopefully, um, hopefully um, that, that was uh, being the last slot. Hopefully we've still got some people on the call. I can't see if anyone's on it. I could be talking to myself. So, um, but yeah, any last questions? I know we've got a few minutes if anyone does have any questions. We definitely have people on, so thank you. Um, yeah, I really thought, Matt, uh, Dan, Matt, Daniel, that was really interesting. I think um, you know, exactly why I wanted you to, um, to invite you along today, because there's, there's obviously lots in there um, that people may have missed. Now, I know that there's some people on here that are potentially looking at employing at the moment. So there may be, um, I know that'll be really useful for them as well. 